Hey everybody, so right toward the end of Avatar The Last Airbender, Aang, our protagonist, is presented with a conflict. He doesn't want to kill Fire Lord Ozai, the main antagonist of the show, but everyone's telling him he kind of has to. You'll have to take the Fire Lord's life before he takes yours. This conflict informs Aang's entire arc in the finale. He freaks out to Katara about how much he doesn't want to do it, goes missing because of how sad he is. He talks to his past selves for guidance, who are all like, just kill him, bro. Just murk Ozai, dude. So it's a big deal in the episode. Then when you figure out a way for me to beat the Fire Lord without taking his life, I'd love to hear it! But in the final moments, Aang finds another way. See, while he was missing, Aang vibed with a lion turtle, who made it possible for him to bend energy. And so, instead of killing Ozai, Aang wins by using his raw spirit force to take his firebending away. What did you do to me? I took away your firebending. You can't use it to hurt or threaten anyone else ever again. A power that he was made aware of 20 minutes ago by a creature we have never seen before. Uh, part zero. The end of Avatar is trash, and here's why. You know, just going over that final plot point, I think it immediately sounds kind of wrong and off-putting. At least it does for me. For one thing, it just kind of comes out of nowhere, right? Toward the end of the finale, Aang goes to chill with a lion turtle, and the turt's like, ooh, you should be cool, Aang. The true mind can weather all the lies and illusions without being lost. And then Aang goes to Ozai and sucks his power slurp slurp right out. If they wanted to end on this note, you'd think they'd introduce the concept of energy bending sooner, give us some buildup, some sense that this could happen within the world of the show. And given this, the whole thing just feels like a deeply contrived effort to make it so our protagonist doesn't have to make a choice. Like, Aang spends basically the entire episode ruminating over whether or not he should kill Ozai. And because of that, we're under the reasonable impression that there are two choices here. Either Aang can kill Ozai and deal with the consequences that that action has, or he cannot kill him and potentially harm himself and the world around him in the process. But through the magic of this random turtle, we avoid that choice, and thereby avoid the meaning that it holds for our main character. What appeared substantial and meaningful is revealed to be an artificial, unnecessary conflict, and that just feels wrong. And then, you know, leaving all that aside, what does this energy-bending choice even mean? What does it tell us as an audience? That killing Ozai is wrong? That it's some deep moral good that Aang doesn't take his life? Please, uh, you know, I'm against killing. I think killing is bad, but killing Ozai? It's just not complicated. Ozai is a murderous, tyrannical creep who is, in this episode, undergoing the process of genociding the entire Earth Kingdom so that he can be the Phoenix King. I shall be reborn as the supreme ruler of the world. From this moment on, I will be known as the Phoenix King. <laughs> Preserving his life is not worth the effort. Effort that could be better spent killing him faster and presumably saving more people. All in all, the whole thing kind of comes off as extremely sentimental and trite. Like, wow, isn't Aang such a special little guy for seeing the importance of every life? Uh, but no, he's not special. Not at all. So for all these reasons, the ending of Avatar is bad. Uh, video done. Donate to my Patreon, etc. So, okay, if I basically made that video and called it a day, how would we feel about it? Well, I think most people, even if they were annoyed or thought I was being pedantic, would at least kind of agree with me. The points I just made aren't particularly original or interesting, and that's because they're obvious. The ending of Avatar is janky and weird, and there's no changing that fact. 
But, you know, being weird and janky isn't the opposite of being great. And while this ending might not be perfect in some kind of 101 textbook on proper storytelling sense, I think it works incredibly well as a thematic and narrative end to the series. I love Avatar a lot. That makes me unique and frankly remarkable as a human being. And today, I want to tell you why I love just one little part of it, and how that one little part speaks to how great and complicated and odd this show is as a whole. So, let's get into it. Part 1. Why are they doing this? So, here's a bit of information that you definitely already know. Aang was never going to kill Ozai, at least not in an explicit, violent way, a way that leaves a corpse behind. It was simply not a possibility. This isn't a criticism of the show, mind you. Avatar is for kids. There's an episode where Aang teaches a crew of nerds how to dance. There's an episode where he builds a zoo. Excellent job, Avatar. You should think about working with animals for a living. A lot of the time, it's a goofy kid show with a fun boy protagonist, and that's part of what makes it great. And to say that the ending isn't good because Aang should have just sucked it up and absolutely slain Ozai, well, I don't think that honors the tone of the show, or the fact that it was on Nickelodeon. That said, all this does leave us with a bit of a question, doesn't it? Why did we have this conflict in the first place? Like, in the episode Day of Black Sun, where Team Avatar invades the Fire Nation, Aang never once thinks to himself, Will I kill a man today? Even in the last episode, where Zuko and Katara go off to take out Azula, they don't kill her, and they don't talk about killing her either. They just imprison her, and it's fine. Nobody gives it a second thought. <laughs> the same could have easily happened with Aang. But the show does not want that. In fact, it's kind of obsessed with how much it doesn't want that. Talking about killing Ozai, Aang and Zuko have this conversation. Maybe we can make some big pots of glue, and then I can use glue bending to stick his arms and legs together so he can't bend anymore. Yeah, then you can show him his baby pictures and all those happy memories will make him good again. <laughs> Do you really think that would work? No! <sighs> Capture him in a glue trap? That's preposterous, says Zuko. But why? Slime certainly wasn't a problem for the show when Sokka used it to take out firebending tanks. And I'll say it again, what Katara does to Azula in the last episode amounts to using a cooler, more serious version of slime. Freezing Azula and then popping some chains on her frozen body. So Zuko categorically dismissing the possibility that they could arrest Ozai in any way is, I don't know, kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Later on, when Aang is talking to a past avatar, Avatar Kyoshi, he points out that she didn't actually kill a despot named Chin the Conqueror. But you didn't really kill Chin. Technically, he fell to his own doom because he was too stubborn to get out of the way. And she says this. Personally, I don't really see the difference, but I assure you, I would have done whatever it took to stop Chin. This is another way the show cuts off a totally reasonable ending it could have had. This is how Admiral Zhao died in the first season, taken by the Ocean Spirit and drowned even as Zuko tried to save him. And the same could have worked fine here. Maybe Ozai dies because of his hubris, or he fall off Big Cliff when he's trying to be big man. But in essence, Kyoshi says that's actually a foul play. If Ozai dies, that shit's on you, Aang, just like Chin the Conqueror dying was on me. So Avatar is deeply attached to railroading Aang into this conflict, right? It contrives two narrative claims out of thin air just to accomplish that end. Aang can't arrest Ozai non-lethally in the way he'd arrest anybody else, and Ozai can't die if Aang doesn't want him to. These obvious kids show mechanics, things Avatar has already done, are thrown out the window. And you'd think, given this, given all the work that the episode puts into this conflict, 
that its meaning would be kind of obvious. That the show would give us a clear idea of what it's going for, why Aang had to wrestle with this problem. But here's the thing, it doesn't give us that obvious message. In fact, whenever we try to apply some meaning here, some explanation for Aang's actions and motivations, the show tells us, nope, that's bullshit, actually. So here's one idea we might have. Maybe the reason why Aang is forced to make this choice is that he has to show integrity, stand by his cultural and moral value that killing is always wrong. That sounds fair. Aang is a vegetarian after all, so there you go. Problem solved. But then, the show suggests that this idea doesn't quite work. When Aang brings this up to a past avatar, Yang Chen, The monks always taught me that all life is sacred even the life of the tiniest spiderfly caught in its own web. She says this. I know that you're a gentle spirit, and the monks have taught you well. But this isn't about you. This is about the world. Here is my wisdom for you. Selfless duty calls you to sacrifice your own spiritual needs. She, in Other Air Nomad, tells Aang that his culture is unimportant here, as she claims he must sacrifice his spiritual needs and cultural traditions because of his duty to the world. The purity of Aang's beliefs are not important to the question of whether he should or shouldn't kill Ozai. Yang Chen thinks that's dumb. We'll come back to this conversation between Aang and Yang Chen in a bit. I think it's more complicated than I just let on. But for now, let's move on to another theory we might have about why why Aang is forced to make this decision. Maybe it's because he has to practice one basic idea, that personal forgiveness is a virtue. When people do bad things, we should always seek to just let it go and move on. This one makes a lot of sense, at least on first blush. Forgiveness and redemption are extremely important motifs of Avatar. From Zuko to Iroh to Jet to Aang, who has to forgive himself for the mistakes he's made. If you are to be a positive influence on the world, you need to forgive yourself. So it would be reasonable to think that this is why he has to choose not to kill Ozai. That said, I don't think this idea quite works either. And that's mostly because of the second to last episode of the show, The Southern Raiders. In that episode, Katara confronts the man who killed her mother in the Southern Water Tribe. His name is Yan Ra. She thinks about killing him, but Aang tells her she's wrong, that she should forgive. Please don't choose revenge. Let your anger out, and then let it go. And when she comes back from her journey, this scene happens. I wanted to take out all my anger at him, but I couldn't. You did the right thing. Forgiveness is the first step you have to take to begin healing. But I didn't forgive him. I'll never forgive him. See, in the case of Yan Ra, there's just nothing here to forgive. For one thing, he's nobody, a hollowed out, impotent man, a coward who fears Katara but doesn't regret anything, who would clearly kill her mother again if he had the chance. And perhaps more crucially, Katara's forgiveness hasn't been attained, simple as that. Yan killed her mom and she's not over it, and you know, why should she be? Her mom's dead. It's a tragic, and I think very honest, episode, and it speaks to why Aang's forgiving Ozai can't really work as the central purpose of this plot. Why it would feel facile and meaningless. Ozai, like Yan ra is a nobody. He only wants one thing, unquestioned power. He only does one thing, cruelty. I do have the power. I have all the power in the world! He would think nothing of killing his son, and he'd think less than nothing of destroying the world. So what could Aang forgive him for, exactly? What would be the point? And leaving all that aside, we know that this plot isn't about some principle of universal forgiveness simply because Aang doesn't forgive. There is no emotional moment between Aang and the Fire Lord. Aang removes his bending and then never really looks at him again. All he's looking at is Katara. Am I right, fellas? <coughs> So a little backstory here, I wrote in the script at that point, thought I needed a joke here, but didn't know what. And now that I'm recording, I guess I just chose to go with 
the Katara joke. So hope you enjoyed that, that one. And now let's get back to the video. Okay, we have a bit of a challenge here, and let me sum it up for convenience. In the most important plot of what's probably the most important episode of Avatar, we have what I guess we could call its most important conflict. Aang figuring out if he should kill Ozai. It's a conflict that takes up a large amount of time, that the protagonist is pushed into repeatedly, even though he didn't have to be. It's not dealt with in a particularly elegant way. As I said before, the resolution solution to this conflict feels weird and out of left field. And to top it all off, it's unclear why this is even the plot that Avatar ends with. What it says about Aang, what message it's actually sending, why it had to be this way. So we have our puzzle in front of us now, rendered for you in full. This strange, confusing, impenetrable ending to what seems like a kind of basic, fun show. Uh, cool. Let's try to solve it. Part 2. Power. Uh, let's take a break from exclusively talking about the last episode. I promise we'll get back to it, but for now, I want to take a few minutes to explore the themes of Avatar as a whole. So, let's get into that. In the finale of Season 2, Aang goes to visit a guru, Guru Patik, who tells him that to control his avatar powers, he has to detach himself from the world entirely, open himself up to the cosmic energy of the universe by moving past his narrow vision of self and detachment. Most important for Aang, he has to give up Katara, at least in some way. Learn to let her go or you cannot let the pure cosmic energy flow in from the universe. Why would I choose cosmic energy over Katara? The advice Patik gives here is extremely interesting, I think, because it directly contradicts advice that Aang receives later on, in the conversation between himself and Yang Chen that we already talked about a bit. As she claims, he can't detach himself from the world in the way many airbenders have, because his duty is to be attached. Many great and wise air nomads have detached themselves and achieved spiritual enlightenment, but the Avatar can never do it because your sole duty is to the world. That's odd, isn't it? We have two old people telling Aang how to do his shit. In their scenes, they both seem correct, both give off a vibe like what they're saying makes sense. But, you know, one says to do X, the other says to do not X. They can't both be right. But here's the thing. Even though it sounds like they're saying opposite things, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Because basically, they're both asking Aang to do the same thing. Sacrifice himself, his life, his beliefs, his connections, for power. Patik says, give up your attachment to your loved ones so you can vanquish Ozai. Yang Chen says, give up on your spiritual needs so that you can vanquish Ozai. And essentially, by offering Aang these two bits of diametrically opposed advice that lead him to roughly the same outcome, they place Aang in a double bind. Either way he chooses, attach or detach, some part of him has to die to do what needs to be done. And why is that? Well, because to these people at least, power is and must be inhuman. This idea that power is by its nature inhuman is one that is repeated over and over again throughout Avatar. It's the kind of thing that seems so obvious when you say it out loud, but which nonetheless kind of escaped me until I watched the show again recently. We can see this in the season 1 episode, The Storm. This episode is extremely important to the show as a whole because it essentially lays down the backstories for Aang and Zuko, the show's main characters. For Zuko, this thematic connection is obvious enough. Sitting in his father's war room, an admiral talks about throwing new recruits into a lethal situation. Zuko sees the inhumanity of this immediately, speaks out, You can't sacrifice an entire division like that! Those soldiers love and defend our nation! How can you betray them? and is scarred and banished by his father as a result. He had a choice here, even though he didn't know it at the time, between power, the Fire Nation's imperialism, and humanity, treating these soldiers with dignity. He couldn't have both. 
Roughly the same thing can be said about Aang. Discovering that he was the Avatar, the monks wanted to move him away, separate him from the person he loved most, Monkey Atso, treat him as an inanimate prop to accomplish the things they wanted him to accomplish. How could they do that to me? They wanted to take away everything I knew and everyone I loved! Whoa! Hot centers! We can see this theme come out in a few minor characters of the show. Characters who have been fundamentally depersoned through their victimization at the hands of the Fire Nation, its power. Hama from the third season was a waterbender who was imprisoned for years and subjected to horrifying treatment by the Fire Nation. And directly because of that trauma, she gains this genuinely horrific power to blood Bend. It's an ability that takes people's humanity away, leaves them without agency, just like the Fire Nation left her. To reach inside someone and control them? I don't know if I want that kind of power. The choice is not yours. The power exists. It's not super subtle, right? She is dehumanized by power, and so she dehumanizes with power. Jet has a similar arc. He's a kid who, like Hama, was traumatized by the Fire Nation. They killed his parents, destroyed his home. And as a result, he seeks a sort of self-defeating vengeance on random people. Daka, you fool! We could have freed this valley! Who would be free? Everyone would be dead. You traitor! And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that the trauma Jet faces takes him down a path that ends with his humanity forcefully being robbed from him. He's brainwashed by the Earth Police such that his decisions aren't his own anymore. Jet, the Earth King has invited you to Lake Laogai. I am honored to accept his invitation. And finally, we can see this theme in one of the most major plots of the show, Aang dealing with the Avatar State. The Avatar State is a mode that Aang can enter that gives him tremendous power, but that leads him without control, occupied by this primeval fury. At his most powerful, he is not himself. In one case, where he merges his soul with the spirit of the ocean to take out some fire boys, He's literally not himself. So, we could go through some more examples, but I think I've made my point here. Over and over in Avatar, power is positioned as this inherently alienating, almost parasitic force. One that invades these characters' lives, takes from them their homes, their families, their bodies, their minds, their beliefs, their personhood. Power is inhuman. But... There's a problem here, I think. That as much as Avatar repeats this idea, as much as it takes it seriously, it's unclear what we're actually supposed to do with any of this. Like, where do we go from here? Let me explain. In the season 2 finale, Aang talks to Iroh. He expresses that he doesn't want to follow Guru Patik's advice, doesn't want to gain power over his Avatar state if it means losing his connection to Katara. I met with this guru who was supposed to help me master the Avatar state and control this great power. But to do it, I had to let go of someone I love. And I just couldn't. And Iroh says this. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you are very wise to choose happiness and love. This is about as close as any character ever gets to saying, point blank, that power is perverse. That Aang absolutely should turn his back on power and just straight up love on Katara all day every day. And watching it, it seems compelling. Like, of course he should do that. Iroh's smart, and he's probably right. But here's the thing, this is probably the most ridiculous advice anyone ever gives on this show. And that's for the simple reason that Aang has to use his big wind power to take out Ozai. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's what the entire show was made to be about and what the entire plot centers around. So this turn your back on power and be happy suggestion just doesn't work. And we know for a fact that it doesn't work because it's overwritten in about five minutes. Standing in front of Azula and Zuko, who are about to kill him, he says, Sorry, Katara, I gotta cut myself off from you and embrace my cosmic destiny. The only way is to let her go. I'm sorry, Katara. So, we're between a rock and a hard place here, I guess. Avatar is, in a sense, about how power is bad. 
but it's narratively hitched to the idea that power is effective and good as hell. What do you do with that? Part 3. The end of Avatar is genius, and here's why. Toward the beginning of this video, we asked a question. Why is the last episode of the show like this? Why is it so fixated on making Aang decide if he wants to kill Ozai or not? And why does it end in this strange, spirit-bending way? And I think, now, the answer kind of seems obvious. It's because that conflict is a reflection of the entire show. Like, he has been told over and over and over in the series, yes, power is inhuman, and yes, you must use it. Yes, power is inhuman, and yes, you must use it. Yes, power is inhuman, and yes, you must use it. And here, it is shouted louder than ever. His past lives congregate to remind him of this basic fact. Yes, even if you think this power to kill is inhuman, you must use it. And so, when Aang refuses to kill Ozai, I don't think it's because of the importance of Ozai's life, his sacredness as a human being, or his ability to get better. Rather, it's because of the importance of Aang. Aang's capacity to be a person, something that has been systematically robbed from him, his people, and from victims he's seen along the way, is restored to him here. He is given one rare opportunity where power doesn't destroy things. To this end, I think energy bending was the best choice imaginable, because it's an ability that comes uniquely from Aang's humanness. As the Lion Turtle says, it works only because Aang won't change, won't be corrupted or taken from himself. To bend another's energy, your own spirit must be unbendable. It works because he has rejected the kind of power that the narrative was railroading him into. What's more, what Aang does here has a lot of symbolic value. You know, the plot in these final moments doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a literal perspective, right? Ozai isn't the Fire Lord because he's more physically powerful than everybody else. It's because he was born to the monarchy. And for that reason, taking his bending away shouldn't by any means impact the loyalty of his people. Because of this, we have to read Ozai's firebending as a representation of his claim to rule. His authority, like his abilities, are monstrously and unjustly inflated, turned against the world as a whole. And through a poetic logic, removing the former also removes the latter. In this regard, Aang's power here is unlike any other power in the show. It isn't about domination or control or ownership. No, it at least feels like this is an act of pure restoration, one that takes power that has been coercively stolen and gives it back to its rightful owners, the people of this world. Let me talk about what happens in the moments before Aang uses his spirit magic to take Fire Lord Ozai's bending away. This absolute beast, Ozai, is just crushing Aang, throwing fireball after fireball as Aang, a literal child, is sitting in some kind of rock igloo praying for his life. And then Ozai lands a final blow, causing Aang to hurtle off into a cliffside. This looks like the end, and it very well might have been, if not for one protruding rock on that cliff. Aang hits that miracle rock in just the right way that it opens up his connection to spiritual energy, allowing him to enter and gain control of the Avatar state. So, uh, obviously, this decision at least seems like one of the stupidest, worst writing calls on the entire show. As we've already talked about a fair amount, entering the Avatar state, having control over his power, was a big conflict for Aang. We learned in the second season from Guru Patik that if Aang wanted to do that, he'd have to give up his earthly attachments, give up Katara. And now, in the last episode, all that just vanishes. Aang masters the Avatar state, and he doesn't do that through any decision, any sacrifice, anything. There's just a straight up rock that bashes into him. It's so iconically dumb, and I'm not gonna argue here that that was an incredible choice. I think this whole rock situation does make the show a bit worse to watch. But what this rock does say to us very clearly is that Guru Patik 
is wrong. Like, embarrassingly wrong. This guy was so invested in this narrative, wherein accessing this power, detaching yourself from earthly connection, was this really important and meaningful task. And then, this scene comes in and says, nope. The Avatar state is about as meaningful as a rock hitting you at the right angle. The ability to be inhuman, to allow this strange alien power to manifest within you and take whatever it deems necessary isn't interesting or exceptional. No, what's really exceptional is Aang, the world he wants to help create, and the people in that world. And the ending that we got, this weird energy lion fiasco, it celebrates them. So that was the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this one was a little bit more work than normal, but uh, you know, you know, you know what they say, right? When you get Avatar fever, it's hard to quit. You know what they mean? You know when they say that. Uh, if you really liked it, like, comment, subscribe, uh, give me money on Patreon if you so choose. And now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Uh, Sam and Olin asks, guinea pigs versus hamsters. Guinea pigs, uh, important little men, essential in these trying times, small little guys. Okay, bye. brief epilogue here because i didn't write any kind of conclusion i think the ending of avatar is cool uh because it's thematic <laughs>